We can always unleash hyenas into the audience. We can always just unleash hyenas into the audience. Charlie said, uh, my name is Oliver Kennedy, and I uh, teach uh, here at UB. I do research. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about some of, uh, not the research that I'm specifically doing, but some tools, techniques, and uh, various other things that I've picked up from uh, colleagues in an area called programming languages. Um, so in spite of the talk, uh, in spite of the title of the talk, I am actually as uh, Charlie said, uh, in databases. So what do I mean when I say programming languages? Because it's a, a bit of an overloaded term. Uh, well, there's an area of computer science called uh, programming languages, which uh, focuses on kind of two general directions, uh, analysis of code and uh, comp uh, compilation of code. So basically figuring out what kind of properties a piece of code has, and uh, one direction that kind of looks at how do I take a piece of code and turn it into a slightly different piece of code. Um, this has, of course, led to a whole bunch of uh, nice innovations that everyone uses these days from compilers to just-in-time compilers to security analysis of code and all sorts of other wonderful things. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is uh, basically what kind of things uh, we, as uh, I'm assuming most people here, uh, given the title of the talk, are database people, uh, what can we as database people kind of grab from this world of PL and kind of bring in uh, to our own uh, experiences. Uh, that said, uh, I figure there's kind of a wide variety of different uh, interests here. Uh, so I'm going to keep most of this uh, buffet style. Um, I will kind of introduce a couple of areas and uh, if you guys are particularly interested in one area, speak up. I'll talk more about it. If you're not interested, uh, say so and I'll move on. Um, so that said, uh, the talk today is going to consist of kind of two general uh, components. Uh, component one, I'm going to talk about three lessons or three kind of appro uh, problem-solving approaches that uh, 
are quite common in programming languages that uh, I think there's a close connection to uh, work, uh, work that we would do uh, as database um, programmers, database users, database developers, database Xs. Um, the other half of the, of the talk is going to go a little bit more uh, rapidly. Um, I'm going to look at a couple of case studies of uh, systems, research, basically projects uh, related to databases that kind of borrow very heavily from uh, the programming language world, and in particular borrow from those three uh, general lessons that I'll uh, outline as well. Um, to some degree, this is kind of a repeat of, uh, or a, a, the same general gist uh, as my talk last year, um, kind of crystal ball, what's on the horizon. But each of these are actually uh, either actual systems or uh, on their way to becoming actual systems. So you can download most of them, play with them, do whatever you want with them. So uh, that said, uh, let me start off with uh, three lessons that I've picked up from the programming language world. Um, and the first of those, when you have a problem, you can solve it with a new language. OK. Uh, that's a little bit overgeneral. So let me uh, make that a little bit more concrete. Let's say I have a problem. Uh, I need to draw a graph. Um, a problem I encounter regularly. You can probably map the same basic principles onto problems that you encounter every day. Uh, I want to draw a graph. So I write a little script that does it for me. Now I want to draw a slightly different graph. Well, I, first time I do it, OK, I'll take my code, I'll copy it, make a new file, rejigger the new file, and now I have a new um, But pretty quickly, that kind of gets untenable. So I'll turn to something slightly different. I'll start adding configuration parameters. Now, as I add configuration parameters, the code's going to get progressively more complex. And I'm going to start seeing a lot of these crazy tuning knobs that uh, I know a year from now, I'm never going to understand what they do. A year from now, I'm going to go back to the code. I can't figure out what it does. So. In the end, uh, what I'll end up doing when I uh, address a problem like this is, like drawing a graph, is I'll come up with some abstractions. I'll try and figure out what I'm doing on a regular basis and come up with a couple of tools, a couple of utilities, uh, and more precisely, a language that allows me to express what I want in the graph. So uh, Basically, the first part of my talk, I want to kind of introduce this idea of domain-specific languages. So uh, quick show of hands, who's heard the term before? OK, so uh, enough that I can kind of move on. But I'll let me start by defining kind of what a domain-specific language for those of you who've, uh, who haven't encountered one of these before. So let's say that I want to. T uh, tell an automated tool um, what I want it to do. Now there's kind of two and there's a huge spectrum of ways that I can do this. Uh, at one end of the spectrum, I can have just a regular configuration file, um, XML, whatever. Uh, and at the, under the other end of the spectrum, I could just write a general uh, program in, in some general purpose language, like C or uh, Ruby or what have you, that kind of tells the, the automated tool what I want it to do. Now these are two kind of very opposite, uh, very different approaches to the problem. And it turns out there's a huge spectrum of, of uh, things that you can do that aren't quite as complex as uh, a general purpose programming language, but at the same time much more powerful than a, uh, than a configuration file. Um, Essentially, there's a number of languages that let me express certain kinds of concepts. Uh, SQL, for example, lets me express uh, data flow, um, how I want to take data, combine it, filter it, and apply uh, standard data processing uh, techniques on it. Um, Ant, for example, will allow me to <clears throat> And for example, will allow me to uh, define 
what kind of dependencies I have in my code, and as a consequence, uh, will allow me to kind of very easily specify how I want to build the process to happen. Um, and there's this. Uh, so basically, a, a domain-specific language is a language that is specific enough, uh, complex enough that it allows me to uh, encode interesting logic in uh, in uh, the program that I'm writing, but at the same time is simple enough that I can just sit down and, and kind of understand what it does. Now, this has a number of benefits. Uh, why why would I even you know why would I write uh, create an entirely new language? Uh, so for one, if, especially if I'm working with users who are not strictly familiar with uh, programming, it, a domain-specific language can often result in lower ramp-up costs. Um, it's, it can be easier to read for domain specialists, and it can do, uh, well, it just makes programs that follow a very specific paradigm much easier to work with. Um, it also allows me to, well, computer scientists, we like to come up with abstractions and abstract out commonly used patterns. It's a great way of doing that. And also, and this is a little bit less, uh, a little bit more tangential, but you can also do interesting optimizations if you uh, know the details of what you're trying to accomplish. Let me give you a few examples of this. Is that, well, it doesn't have to be super readable. Here's a complex piece of code um, from a language called, uh, in a language called uh, Diderot. And this is targeted at uh, mathematicians, uh, at physicists. Um, now, physicists, uh, there are plenty of physicists, physicists who know how to uh, program in, in C and such. Uh, but one interesting feature of this language is that, uh, where's my, one interesting feature of this language is that you can actually uh, in, use math symbols in Unicode to actually convey ideas. So for example, uh, over there I've got uh, the gradient of f. Um, that's something anyone who even doesn't necessarily have uh, programming experience can sit down and understand that that little thing represents the gradient of f. Um, it's a little bit uh, weird to program in, but it's very easy uh, for domain specialists to read. You can also encode common patterns and abstractions using this. So my uh, example of uh, drawing graphs earlier, there's certain kinds of things that occur very frequently. I'll want to set the range of uh, a plot. I'll want to set uh, where the key appears. There's preferences. And uh, that's. All right, no one, no one uh, nap here. Um, so for those kinds of things, I can uh, abstract them nicely with these very short lines uh, up here, uh, while at the same time retaining uh, the ability to do uh, sort of complex data transformations uh, in the, the code itself. And finally, there's uh, some nice opportunities for optimization. So uh, domains, uh, there's a domain-specific language called SGL, which uh, takes uh, this is designed for um, building simulations. Um, can actually take this uh, simulation program, and it's designed in such a way that uh, all of these simulation programs uh, boil down to something that looks very much like a SQL query, uh, which it can then do some very aggressive optimization on and um, produce really, really uh, impressively performant simulations for very, very large scale um, worlds. Uh, this is targeted at uh, games, but uh, you can use it for a bunch of other things. Um, not that games aren't awesome. Um, so domain specific languages give you a huge uh, amount of flexibility for um, uh, creating, uh, for telling uh, specialized programs uh, how to work and for solving specialized problems. Um, that said, there, there are certain cases where you don't necessarily, well, there's a lot of overhead that goes into writing a domain specific language. Um, well, hmm? And maintain, sure. Uh, depends on, well, if you're targeting Ruby, uh, that changes fast enough. Hmm? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, basically. Um, so domain-specific languages are great, uh, but before you create one, I'm, I'm selling them pretty hard, I hope. Uh, but uh, you want to you know, take a look. If uh, Can you create the, uh, the language in a library? Uh, sorry, can you create those features in a library? Is, your, uh, is the only thing that's going to be accessing your code um, other code in, let's say, C++? Well, then it's probably a great candidate for just writing into a library. Um, essentially, the, the main purpose of a domain-specific language is if you need to be able to uh, something close to a Turing-complete language uh, to you need to give your users something close to a Turing-complete language uh, to provide whatever logic they want uh, to you. So that said, um, how do you go about creating a domain-specific language? Now, this is, this is basically, as uh, Wayne pointed out, a uh, massive, massive undertaking. Uh, so I'm going to only touch on kind of the, uh, this from a very, with a 10-foot pole. Um, this is basically an entire course in here. Uh, so rather than trying to say everything, I'm going to give you a high-level picture. Um, one strategy would be to do everything top to bottom. Um, I generally don't recommend this. This is probably not something you want to do. Um, far easier, and something that uh, is very good for prototyping a domain-specific language, just to see if it, uh, if it makes sense before you dive into the deep end, uh, is to implement it as uh, a DSL. Um, a lot of interpreted languages, uh, Ruby and Scala in particular, and I think Python has some uh, features that are, make, this, uh, make it amenable to this as well. Um, these languages have features that allow you to kind of define the syntax of the language um, using the language itself. Um, so Ruby in particular has some very nice uh, features for this. Uh, Ruby's blocks are a great way to uh, define iterators, to define, uh, basically to pass in, well, I mean, uh, the blo uh, while loops, for example, could be implemented as, uh, as just regular uh, Ruby blocks um, has a very healthy operator overloading has very capable operator overloading capabilities um, and the ability to kind of inspect classes it's got very good introspection capabilities but I think the real uh, interesting feature of Ruby that makes it very amenable to domain specific languages is the fact that um, and this is this is not immediately evident, but the fact that the uh, that as you're defining a class in Ruby, uh, so who's familiar with Ruby in general? Okay, uh, who's well? I, I'm going to assume that there's uh, some familiarity with object-oriented programming here. Um, but as you're defining a class in Ruby, one of the nice features of it is that the the process of defining a class is uh, itself run in the interpreter. So the, um, you're not defining a class as kind of this big atomic operation. There's actually interpreted code that is progressively defining new functions, progressively defining um, every aspect of um, the, the DSL, uh, of, sorry, of the class. And a lot of uh, systems make good use of this. So Rails, for example, uh, uses this very extensively for annotating classes, which is one of the nice things that you can do in, in a uh, Ruby DSL. Um, the other nice feature of Ruby that makes it very amenable, uh, and this is shared by pretty much every interpreted language, is that it's weakly typed. Um, I can pass uh, a wide variety of different arguments to a, a method and have it react kind of dynamically to what those arguments are. Um, the example I have here is from uh, Rake, which uh, lets you define tasks. But it lets you define tasks uh, either as just a uh, uh, symbol object or as kind of a map from that symbol object to uh, a set of dependencies. Um, this allows <clears throat> this allows Rake to have this weird little uh, syntax that makes it quite clear here that foo depends on bar. Foo implies bar. Um, let me give you an example of how this ends up uh, getting implemented. 
Uh, so the, uh, here I have a couple of uh, examples from Wikipedia uh, showing how the uh, file uh, task, uh, how in rake you, def um, so rake is basically a Ruby version of uh, make. And one of the things that you can do in it is define how to create a file. So this basically says, I'm going to create a file. Uh, in order to create the file hello.o, you first need to look at the file hello.c. And then here's a little block of code that tells me exactly how to uh, create that, um, that file. Now, this is actually something that you can implement very, very quickly in, uh, in Ruby, simply because uh, these features that is, I've been describing. Uh, so you can take uh, this do end following uh, an arbitrary keyword is just a regular feature of the language. You can pass in a arbitrary block of code uh, to any function, and that uh, arbitrary block of code can get picked up by a uh, <clears throat> by basically just as a regular argument argument to the function uh, by prepending the argument name with an ampersand. Um, you can also take advantage of weak typing to get uh, handle different argument types. And there's a plethora of features like, for example, at exit, which allow me to uh, run things after all of the other code has uh, completed. So essentially, the, uh, this uh, file feature of rake is a very tiny amount of Ruby. Um, now, I'm not going to get into too much uh, depth about this. Um, the one kind of weird and nifty but very undocumented feature of Ruby that um, I took forever to try and find um, documentation on this. But uh, if you look at, where's my laser pointer? So, a class definition, uh, or a function definition in Ruby just instantiates the function in whatever the, uh, whatever the scope of the enclosing method is. So here, I'm actually defining a function uh, bar that itself defines a new function. And that just blows my mind that you can actually do this. Um, you can define. Basically, until I call bar, this function baz isn't defined. Um, and this basically allows me to do all sorts of crazy stuff with uh, the class structure with you know, pretty much just everything in, in Ruby. Um, Very easy to shoot yourself. Uh, yes, but it also makes, you, it, makes it very easy to create uh, domain-specific languages, which is arguably the same thing, but I'll leave that for that's not the point I'm trying to make. Philosophy. Yes. All right. So uh, I can talk more about domain-specific languages, but um, well, limited time budget. Uh, that's probably a, a talk in and of itself. One interesting thing is that the PostgreSQL database allows for you to do the same thing inside of itself as uh, procedural languages. So you have PL, like Perl, mm -hmm. Yep. So it allows you to, inside of the database, create a DSL for working with SQL in arbitrary syntax. And translating arbitrary things into SQL? So there's a PL Ruby, for example. Yeah, yeah. It's not uh, a whole language, but it's basically a, a, the language, the DSL where the language feels like... Like SQL. Like, well, you work with SQL, but it feels like you're working with in, in... Huh. Uh, that might be an interesting talk. For October. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Who said that? No, no, no. <laughs> All right. So lesson number one. Uh, lesson number one is create a language for it. Lesson number two. Let's say I have a, a solution that I've already come up with. That solution works for a couple of cases. Lesson number two from programming languages is that you can always take a solution that you've already made and transform it into something different. Um, 
Now, that is in and of itself a very broad statement. Um, so I'm going to focus on a specific instance of, of this problem and leave it to you to generalize. Uh, two specific instances, to be precise. Uh, the first, let's say I have lots of small processes and I want to coordinate them. I want to coordinate them very, very uh, quickly and efficiently. Um, I could do this in Ruby, but uh, in an uh, interpreted language like Ruby, which would make it very easy to read, very easy to write uh, the coordination logic, but at the same time uh, could potentially be rather inefficient. Um, I could do it in C++, but at the same time, uh, that would make it fast. But at the same time, that would make it potentially a bit harder to uh, think about the code at a very high level. And worse still, what if I want to be able to change this coordinate, coordination logic at runtime? Um, that could be quite tricky in either of these languages. Um, another example, uh, let's say I'm writing a database uh, system or a large program that needs to have some kind of, um, let's say I'm writing a large database system, I want to be able to embed some kind of logic into that program that I'm writing. Uh, for example, in a, in a database system, I want, might want to uh, provide external triggers. Um, now, I could implement plugins. Uh, I could take some C code that uh, implements my trigger. I could embed it into that program, but uh, well, this leads to code bloat. Uh, this, sorry, not code. Uh, this means I need to implement uh, a loader unloader. And worse still, uh, it makes it very hard to sandbox that code. Uh, so this, uh, if I have the ability to arbitrarily load code into, uh, into my program, well, that could lead to some security issues. I could also write my own interpreter for you know, whatever language I want to create, but that could be quite slow. So what I want to introduce here is this uh, kind of automated system for, um, or a set of automated systems, family of these, uh, that allow me to transform my code. Um, so there are these uh, wonderful things called uh, compiler toolkits. Um, the two I'm going to focus on at the moment are one for us. Uh, it's for a bunch of things, but essentially for C uh, called LLVM, and uh, one for the JVM called Graal, which has just started uh, development uh, by Oracle. The, uh, the basic idea of a compiler toolkit is that they provide you with kind of the core machinery that you need to um, make arbitrary domain-specific languages is their main focus, but basically uh, arbitrary dynamic code run very, very fast. Um, and often this is done basically by taking whatever code you provide and compiling it all the way down to either machine code or uh, Java byte code. So in the case of LLVM, um, if you have a Mac, and I see a couple of them in the room, uh, you're very familiar with this because this is essentially how you compile things on a Mac uh, these days. LLVM is basically the, uh, or more specifically, Clang, CLang, whatever you want to call it, uh, is basically the uh, main compiler uh, on uh, in Xcode at the moment. Um, but LLVM is actually a much more uh, rich toolkit. Um, it essentially provides a pipeline with a whole bunch of uh, front ends, uh, languages that you can kind of feed into it, and a whole bunch of uh, back ends or uh, runtime environments. Um, so, like I said, this is basically uh, the way that Macs compile things nowadays. Um, you take some C code and feed that into LLVM and out pops some machine code. Um, there's also interpreters. There's uh, kind of a wide. Th there's a very rich set of tools, and kind of the the really nice thing about this is that the basic pipeline is already there. So you can go from C or any of a number of other languages. I believe there's Scala and Ruby um, back uh, front ends in various stages of development. Um, you can go from C all the way to machine code without any kind of, I mean, that, that's already there. 
what you uh, then need to provide is kind of you can plug into this pipeline wherever you want. Uh, so if I ha if you have your own domain specific language, and I'll get to an example of this in the the second half of my talk. If you have a domain specific language, uh, you can basically translate that language into kind of their internal code representation, the LLVM AST, and it'll optimize it for you. It'll um, then translate that into either machine code for whatever platform you want, uh, or it'll just interpret it and uh, let you run the, the code right then and there. Um, and that's LLVM.org, um, one cool system. Uh, Oracle also decided to jump into this game. They have recently, in the last year or so, uh, started developing a system called Graal, which uh, essentially allows you to plug into the JVM, and uh, more specifically into the uh, JVM's just-in-time, uh, or most JVM's just-in-time compilers. Now this is really kind of cool. Um, unlike, uh, unlike LLVM, where you actually have to translate into its uh, kind of internal representation. Here, you write an interpreter. That's all you need to do. Uh, you write an interpret interpreter. Okay, almost all you need to do. You need to annotate it a little bit, but then their tool basically kicks in and allows you to um, essentially takes your interpreter and uh, produces JVM bytecode. Uh, or produces a, a compiler that compiles uh, anything in the language that this interpreter interprets down to JVM bytecode, which it can then uh, optimize kind of on the fly. And they've got some pretty clever tricks for doing this. Um, one other connection, um, I mentioned this was Oracle behind this, uh, in particular Oracle Labs, and uh, the head of Oracle Labs, a guy named Eric Sedler, uh, gave a really nice keynote uh, recently at uh, one of the major database research conferences where he basically flat out said that it was his personal goal to make this tool chain replace the innards of Oracle. Now, why this is cool? This is cool because it basically means that using this compiler tool chain, you're going to be able to replace the innards of Oracle with whatever you want. You basically end up working with the, the core database uh, for anything that you need, but let's say you don't like their join algorithm. You create a new one. Let's say you want to create a domain-specific language uh, to replace uh, SQL, um, like, uh, well, actually would end up being easier than working with uh, PL uh, or trying to create your own version of PL Ruby or PL, you know, what have you. And in fact, they have their own kind of PL Ruby plugins that end up. Long story short, um, this I, I'd keep an eye on this because uh, at least Oracle is going to be very, uh, very. Hope uh, I'm anticipating that this will probably end up. Um, turning into kind of a central feature uh, of, of Oracle in maybe five, two to five years. So anyway, um, these, these tools are kind of out there. Um, LVM has some, it's definitely the much more mature tool. It has a lot of um, nice front ends. And like I said, uh, Apple's been supporting this for, uh, what is it, five years now? Uh, it's a much more mature platform, um, but I, it's a much more mature platform, but at the same time, um, at least arguably, uh, writing and uh, translating to kind of its internal representa data representation, um, I'd argue is probably going to be a little bit harder than trying to write an interpreter for uh, a DSL. So uh, I'll keep an eye on both of these. All right, um, lesson two, transform the solution. Lesson three, analyze the solution. I have a piece of code. Um, one of the kind of central tenets of programming languages is uh, to be able to look at a piece of code, analyze it, and come up with interesting properties about it. 
Now this is going to be kind of the more, um, this is going to be me with my database hat on, uh, because unlike the other two lessons, this, kind of, this is a lesson for the programming languages community. Um, but it's a lesson that we as, as a group uh, have the ability to, to teach them. Uh, why do I say that? Well, if I have a code base, um, compiler, what a compiler will do, uh, or many kinds of uh, code analysis tools end up doing, is looking at uh, data dependencies uh, in the code. And uh, what is a data dependency? Well, basically you've got a graph of kind of connections between different nodes, and you want to find things like reachability, distance, cost. This is something we've been doing for a while now. Um, debugging. Debugging is basically, uh, I, uh, I want to figure out when a given condition holds in the database, uh, sorry, in, in uh, the state of this program. There's actually a research group here that's trying to address this problem, looking at how to uh, figure out when a, uh, a given condition holds uh, in the execution of a program. And what is an optimizing compiler? Uh, this is basically a find, and re uh, find me all instances of a given pattern in this recursive data structure and replace them with something else. Uh, this, these are all problems that database people have been looking at and addressing and, and trying to figure out for a very, very long time. And uh, more and more, uh, well, code is, is, code bases are certainly not getting smaller. Um, kind of hardly see it here, but that's 1.2 million lines of code in Android as of uh, as of four years ago. It's only gotten bigger since then. Um, this is a space where databases a database driven compiler um, would be kind of a There's, there's something here. Um, so I think kind of as, as the database community, it's our, in a sense, responsibility to uh, try and figure out how our tools can be used uh, for, uh, to address programming language problems as well. OK, rant over. On to some actual systems. Um, so I'm going to talk about a handful of case studies where um, programming language techniques have kind of infiltrated uh, various database develop design and development efforts. And like I said, all of these, uh, with two exceptions, are published systems. So you can basically go out, if any of these are intriguing, you can basically go out and uh, download, play with just about any of them. Um, the one, uh, even the ones that aren't have kind of are, are on their way to becoming published systems. So uh, a couple of years down the line, uh, you'll probably see some of these. All right. The first of these, uh, a system called Hyper. Now, what is uh, the the basic? Excuse me. The basic observation of these guys is that if I'm trying to solve a problem, uh, a data-driven problem, um, and I have a, I'm working with a relatively small amount of data, or, sorry, if I, I'm trying to solve a, uh, a data-driven problem, I'm always going to be better, uh, be able to solve that problem more efficiently if I write handwritten C code. Why is this? Uh, this is because just about every major database system has at least some level of interpretation going on. Even if it's just um, trying to evaluate uh, a small little set of, uh, a small little piece of arithmetic, uh, column A plus column B, and then aggregate over uh, that result, that one little piece of uh, interpreter overhead is going to cost you a lot. Now this kind of dies down as uh, you start getting you know, just-in-time compilation can uh, save you a little bit, dealing with things like uh, 
databases that do uh, SIMD operations, um, they compare against um, MoonADB, but vector-wise, column stores are, are basically going to uh, save you once you have kind of a sufficient amount of data that you're trying to process at a given time. But you're still never going to quite reach the performance of a hand-coded C program. So what their gimmick is, uh, is that they actually plug in to LLVM. Um, so they'll take, uh, they'll take a select query, they'll come up with an execution plan, just like any normal database system, but once they hit that execution plan, uh, they're not just going to execute that directly, they're actually going to take it a step further and compile that down to something that looks kind of like C code, and then they're going to transform, uh, send that uh, to LLVM. Um, LLVM can then uh, well, it has an interpreter, it also has a, a, full, a fully fledged um, compiler to machine code behind it. So essentially it's going to take uh, what, the, what these guys essentially do is kind of translate that SQL query into directly into machine code, which as a result um, gets performance that is quite close to um, what you could do with a handwritten C program. Um, they have a website, hyperdb.com. I encourage you to check it out. Here's where I'm going to get a little bit self-serving. Uh, another point where I'm going to get a little bit self-serving. Uh, this is uh, part of my thesis work um, and si has since been picked up by a number of uh, very enthusiastic uh, graduate students looking to make their names as well. Um, DB Toaster is uh, also a system that takes a SQL query and it compiles it down to a, a program. Uh, the gimmick here is that it monitors the query. So this is good for kind of um, incremental, well, I use the term incremental view maintenance lightly um, since that tends to be, uh, well, I don't know about you guys, uh, every time I hear the word incremental view maintenance, uh, at least before this project, I thought slow and crawl. Yeah. Maybe the guys up here in front can say differently, but incremental view maintenance is. Anyway, long story short, uh, DB Toaster basically uh, makes incremental view maintenance fast, among other things, by compiling. Uh, it, it has a number of other tricks that it pulls, but one of them is uh, that it compiles things down to either C or Scala. And as you can see, it outperforms uh, kind of the uh, two comparison points here are a mysterious unknown uh, database, uh, who, uh, which certainly isn't Oracle, um, and a mysterious uh, stream processing system, which is very definitely not um, stream base. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, did I say that out loud? Um, as you can see, uh, the kind of two output formats that we create kind of end up being quite a few orders of magnitude faster than uh, what the commercial database systems uh, can keep up with. So uh, again, if incremental view maintenance or kind of data monitor stream monitoring, well, data monitoring are up your alley, I encourage you to check out DB Toaster. Okay, um, so there's a couple of systems out there that take SQL queries and compile them down to the bare metal. Um, what about program analysis? So uh, about two, well, about five years ago, a couple of guys at um, Berkeley came up with this idea called the COM conjecture. And the COM conjecture basically says that a program um, as long as it's uh, what's called logically monotonic, um, will always be safe for use with eventual consistency. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, a monotonic program is one that uh, once you learn something, you can never unlearn it. So for example, uh, an, a, a trivial logically monotonic program would be uh, a set that I'm always adding to. Um, the only operation that I can per perform on that set is adding a new element. And I'm never going to find out that an element is part of that set if, uh, if it's not. 
Now, why is this safer use with, with eventual consistency? Um, well, basically for that reason, that uh, I never learn a fact is true unless it actually is. Um, and I can pretty easily code around that. Uh, in particular, if I'm working with sets. And so uh, the same guys came up with this uh, nifty programming language called uh, Bloom, uh, which they have implemented as a uh, prototype Ruby DSL, link up there, uh, which allow, is basically built around sets. And all of the logic that, the, the basically the only way to express computation in this language is uh, by kind of moving things from one set to another. Now, you know, there's a limited set, uh, a limited space of uh, programs that you can express in this, but they've actually come up with some very interesting uh, paradigms. Um, for example, you can express a key value store um, entirely with sets. What do I mean by that? Um, the, you can essentially express message passing using sets. Um, every time I want to retrieve an item from the key value store, I add kind of a message to this you know, mailbox set that says, OK, I would like to read uh, a value from uh, the key value store. And then the, the key value store actually kind of goes and moves information from one set to another, uh, uh, moves from the, the set that it's maintaining to kind of another Dropbox. Um, a little bit weird, but one of the nice uh, things about it is that you can, because everything is expressed by the movement of, of data through uh, from one set to another, it's possible for them to figure out where kind of the roadblocks are, where um, where you need to put locking or mutexes, or basically where you need to put uh, synchronization primitives in order for this uh, program to be correct. And while this kind of low level uh, view is awkward, um, they're putting together a number of kind of primitives on top of it that make it a little more sensible for actual human developers to work with. So again, bloomlang.net, I uh, encourage you to check that out. OK. Um, the next one is just flat out weird, but also kind of cool. And this is, uh, this is one that I probably wouldn't expect to see as a um, published implementation for another year, probably two, three years. But just the idea of this is, is cool enough that I had to include it. Um, so the idea is that you can provide, if I were to start with like a traditional, very simple, naive algorithm for some kind of process, let's say a nested, uh, let's say I wanted to implement a join. The most trivial way that I could express that is as a simple nested loop join. Um, loop over all of the elements of S, loop over all of the elements of R, and then emit those that are the same. Now, this works reasonably, uh, well, for some definition of reasonably, this works uh, well enough uh, if you're just in RAM, but as people decades ago realized, it doesn't work very well if you're on disk. So, well, the solution that they came up with several de decades ago was let's start buffering things uh, into RAM uh, incrementally, and we got the block nested loop join. So, this worked well enough until we started getting cache. And, well, cache is really much faster than RAM, so now we want to do another layer of this. And it turns out that this basic transformation, uh, buffering, um, buffering kind of uh, data uh, so that you loaded just enough that would fit in cache and RAM on disk, um, and on every other level of the memory hierarchy um, as we keep getting new levels. Um, it turns out that this is a very uh, almost procedural transformation that happens. 50 people write uh, research papers on it, and it turns out it's 
basically the same cookie cutter transformation applied to algorithms that people have been using for decades. And so what uh, these guys did is, well, it's a cookie cutter approach, uh, a cookie cutter set of transformations. Okay, if I can do that, then maybe I can just automate the process of applying those transformations. And it turns out you can. Um, so they start with a very basic naive algorithm, um, bubble sort, um, <clears throat> uh, bubble sort, uh, nested loop join, what have you, and apply a common set of algorithmic tricks, uh, like for example, uh, block buffering. Um, if I'm doing aggregation, I can maybe split that up using combiners, um, converting iterators to uh, SIMD operations through loop unrolling. Um, basically, they Build up a, built up a common library of every single, well, almost every single trick that people have tried to apply to algorithms uh, to deal with new levels of the memory hierarchy, to deal with uh, distribution, to deal with basically all of the, the crazy settings that, um, uh, and different machine architectures that we've come up with. And they have basically an optimizer so you provide a specification for the hardware that you're running on. They pull out their bag of tricks, try every possible combination of uh, tricks to, um, they apply every single possible combination of tricks, and they come up with an algorithm that is uh, provably optimal for the architecture that you are running on. I don't know. Now this is pretty cool. Um, and there's a link up there if you're interested. OK. Last piece of self-serving, uh, self-promoting uh, um, content in this, uh, this talk. Uh, a system that uh, I've personally been working on uh, called Just-In-Time Data Structures. So um, let's say I'm trying to come up with a solution to uh, a data structure to address some kind of problem that I've been working on. Uh, let's say, for example, I want to be able to do range queries and updates on, um, uh, I want to store a set of records and I want to be able to do range queries and updates on that set. Now there's a slew of different data structures that I might uh, pull out of my bag of tricks to, to address that. Um, a sorted array, a B tree, uh, just a regular heap if I want to, uh, don't care about reading from it. And each of those has trade offs. Uh, so a sorted array, I can't really update it very efficiently, but it's going to be super, super efficient because everything is contiguous in memory, everything is, uh, uh, <clears throat> is right there. Uh, you get cache locality, you get everything. B tree is going to be much more efficient to update. Uh, I don't necessarily need to uh, keep everything in one contiguous chunk of memory, but at the same time, uh, it's going to be a little bit less efficient to read out of. And a heap kind of goes the other, to the other end of the, spec uh, the spectrum. So each of these data structures makes a fixed set of trade-offs. Now the question that we tried to ask is, can you change those trade-offs at runtime? And it turns out that you potentially can. Um, so what if we had the ability to kind of start the data structure in um, as if it were a sorted array? So I do my startup. Um, everything is nice and, and organized. Uh, and I want the, perf the read performance of a sorted array. Then I get a set of inserts. Well, I don't necessarily want my performance to, uh, on the inserts to be uh, poor. So then I'd like to kind of switch over to the, the performance of, let's say, a B tree. Dynamically switch over, turn my data structure into a B tree. Now I could do that, be potentially quite expensive to do that. Um, but then as I get more and more free cycles, I'd like to kind of switch back uh, to the performance characteristics of a, a sorted array, get better read performance. And so um, we came up with this idea called just in time data structures, and this is. Um, this particular data structure that I'm about to describe is actually uh, available on GitHub. Um, so the, the basic idea is that rather than having a fixed uh, data structure, 
you instead have kind of building blocks for a data structure. Um, so if I'm building a B tree, that B tree kind of has a very standard layout. I have these kind of um, B tree nodes that, well, they say, okay, if the value that you're looking for is less than something, follow the left hand, follow this pointer to my left. If it's greater, follow this pointer to my right. Standard, really straightforward. Um, whereas a sorted array is just one contiguous array of, of records. We can kind of step back and look at these as building blocks. So a sorted array might be one building block. A B tree node might be another building block. And so what we'd like to be able to do is kind of find, use these building blocks to construct something kind of in between. And kind of the key to this is one of the, the uh, you know, central ideas of, of programming languages that you treat everything as a local transformation. And what does that mean? Well, it means that you work with a lot of black boxes. So I have my original data. And if I want to model an insertion, I can in, uh, model that as kind of an, a new building block. I can have a building block that says, take all of the records to my left and combine them with all of the records to my right. Union, essentially. Um, so if I want to add a three to my data set, I can create a new building block that says, take whatever is, was in the data structure beforehand and add a three. But that's not a sorted array. So let's say that I did have a sorted array to begin with. Um, I could model the data that uh, <clears throat> I could model the data in after the insertion in two different ways. I could model it as this kind of union of two different sets, and I could model it as just an actual sorted array. Now, from the kind of outside in, these are basically the same thing. They're representing the same set of data. Now, if I'm looking for a particular record, they may not necessarily be the same because, well, one's going to be more efficient than the other. But if I'm looking for a three, eventually I'll get a three out of both of these sets. But what's really nifty is that uh, because they represent the same data, I can dynamically replace one of these objects with another. So I can dynamically replace this uh, funky, inefficient representation of the data with a much more efficient one. And I can do that whenever I want, because they represent the same data. I can do something similar with a B tree. So if I have, um, if I try and add a three into a B tree, I can model the, uh, I can kind of make that B tree a little more efficient by pushing the this this weird union uh, building block down into the B tree node that. Uh, contains, the, in this case, the three. And again, uh, everything else, everything other than those two nodes that I move around can be treated as a black box. I don't really care what's in, in each of those. The transformation, this local transformation, or this local rewrite, is the same regardless of what's in those black boxes. I do this thing recursively, and eventually I get to a leaf where I can turn this, I can come up with a new B tree node. Again, everything, I can express all of the changes that I'm trying to perform on this, this uh, data structure as a local rewrite of just one portion of my data structure. So what this allows me to do is have these weird hybrid data structures that contain some sorted arrays and some B trees. Or sorry, some B tree nodes. In this case, I have a B tree node connecting one, two, and four and five, and I want to insert a three into it. I can use the same two rewrites that I just described uh, in order to push the three down into the B tree and then merge the three into that sorted array that I have over there. Of course, I don't necessarily have to do that. That's potentially going to be a very expensive operation. Uh, inserting a new object into a, a B tree is potentially going to be, uh, sorry, in, into a sorted array is potentially going to be quite expensive. So if I don't have the cycles, I can just as easily create a new B tree node instead 
do the, the, the same B tree leaf rewrite that I described earlier. Then when I have cycles, eventually I can kind of reorganize, concatenate everything back into a sorted array. Like I said, this has been implemented. It's uh, available on my GitHub. Um, and I don't have a link up there, but if you just search for Oliver Kennedy, um, it's linked from my web page. Um, nice thing about it, uh, so we tested this on a, a uh, on a uh, kind of uh, against a set of data structures that uh, kind of dynamically adapt to, uh, to new reads. So the, the idea is that uh, as you get more and more reads, uh, these data structures kind of self-organize and uh, use some of the effort that they're, they're um, putting into answering the read uh, into making subsequent reads more efficient. Uh, two things, uh, one called uh, database cracking, one called adaptive merge trees. And um, well, adaptive merge trees have this kind of annoying property that the first time, uh, so here we have a write uh, adaptive merge trees have this annoying property that immediately after a write, uh, they slow down like crazy because they have to organize all of that data, uh, at least organize it a little bit. Uh, whereas we can kind of, uh, whereas these, these kind of cracking databases uh, end up having worse performance at the tail. Um, eventually, uh, they, they just do a worse job of, of organizing the data in the long term. And we can kind of get the best of both worlds. So. Um, you guys are interested, I can talk at length about this, um, but that's probably a topic for another time. Uh, so one last uh, system I want to kind of bring to your attention, um, an analytics system called Logic Blocks. Um, and kind of the, the nifty thing about Logic Blocks is that everything is uh, a materialized view. Everything is based on uh, a language called Datalog. Um, if you've never heard of it, uh, it's, it has some nice features. Um, I'll, basically, it's very easy to optimize. And kind of the idea behind logic blocks is that everything is a materialized view. So every time you run a computation, it essentially creates a new materialized view uh, that either caches, monitors, or just records all of the uh, the, the data that you're trying to uh, store. And um, for example, here I could create a uh, view called weak profit that stores uh, the, pro um, <clears throat> the price uh, of every single ice cream product that I'm selling uh, times the volume of sales that I've received that week. Um, and then I could define another view called ag profit that uh, stores that actually aggregates all of the, uh, the total profit for each week. Um, and while it turns out that this is a surprisingly easy language to write analytics queries in, and they have a number of interesting features for uh, kind of more complex uh, linear optimization and uh, well, actually, mostly linear optimization. Uh, but one of the, uh, in spite of that, this is very easy for a compiler to work with. And these guys are kind of very, take a very principled approach to uh, optimizing, to, to writing all of their code. Um, they'll sit down for months at a time before actually even writing, well, maybe not months, but they sit, they basically, all of their uh, work, um, is very based on kind of very well thought out um, algorithms. Very uh, this is basically what happens when you get uh, an academic who actually knows how to sell a product. Um, it's impressive. Uh, they've got good performance, um, but kind of the a lot of their their performance comes from the fact that the the language that they're developing um, does a really good job of encouraging programmers to use uh, features that are the, the system can handle easily. Uh, equi-joins, um, aggregate, uh, aggregates being represented as their own materialized views. Um, these are all kind of 
gimmicks that the, the system is able to encourage programmers to use by good language design. And that kind of brings me back to the original point, uh, or the, the kind of original uh, lesson. Designing a language, if you can kind of come up with a language to specify your problem in. That's kind of the, a, if you can have a good language for, for describing the problem that you're trying to solve, that basically means you've solved the problem uh, once you get to that point. You know, there's code, uh, there's always code to write, and there's always bugs to debug, but once you have the, the language, um, I found that that's kind of like, that's, let's say, 60% of the way to having a solution. Uh, so with that, um, that's what I have to say. Um, I can expand on any of that. I can, I can hide under here and unleash the hyenas on me. Yeah, get the, get the tomatoes ready. So, yeah, that's. Did, uh, is it possible to get these slides? Mm -hmm. I'll publish them on, um, I will publish both these and uh, there are several cameras recording, so all of this. Uh, so all these me uh, mechanisms that you were just uh, are any of them, could any of them be applied to say open source database like Postgres to help in like efficiency and I'd, so Postgres implements, I could see some of the, the DSL, I mean, as you said, uh, Postgres has uh, the, well, the ability to in incorporate uh, DSLs. Um, Postgres itself is more of a backend. Um, a lot of the, the tools that I described are kind of themselves backends. Uh, I should add a lot of almost all of the tools, except for Logic Blocks and DB Toaster, although that's changing, um, are open source. So you can download them, play around with them, compile them, do whatever you want with them. Um, I was especially curious with DB Toaster. Oh, it, it was. It is. Uh, I mean, basically, you give it a SQL query, and it spits out C code. Or it spits out. Um, that'd actually be an interesting thing to to look at. Um, you, yeah, um, I mean, you could. Uh, it'd probably be a project in and of itself to to get that linked into uh, the uh, into Postgres's query optimizer. But I mean, Postgres lets you embed arbitrary C code, so I. Uh, I don't see why not. Um, you could, yeah, you know, basically treat it, um, treat, yeah, I, I, hypothetically, yes. Um, do you have X man months to uh, help out with that? Well, yeah, I don't pretend to work at work. So. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> is that recorded? Oh. But, yeah. Um, you download that, uh, I mean, it, like I said, generate C code, you can do whatever you want with the C code, including embedding it into Postgres or embedding it into translation layer might be a little weird. Yeah? Hyper? So, so LLVM in that case is used mainly as uh, for coordination logic. Um, their uh, logo kind of does. Uh, where is it? I don't know if you can. I don't know if you can see that, but they basically have uh, we'll call it the LLVM is the kind of chain that links the C++ cogs together. So basically the, the core of the database is still implemented in uh, like 
you still have all of your operators implemented in something like C++ or C, in this case C++, but uh, the query plan itself makes calls into those operators as just regular C function calls rather than through an inter uh, through the over uh, through this this over uh, overlay of an interpreter. Um, does that? Uh, so, so, I, so you've been by operations like scans, things that are executable, that will scan some arbitrary instruction. Regular C++ iterator. I mean, okay, maybe not a regular C++ iterator, but uh, essentially it's similar principle that you have. Uh, you turn a scan over a, a table into a for loop over whatever data structure is uh, is being used internally. Uh, but is, is the implementation of this, like, since this is a working product? Yeah. Like, uh, I mean, in order for that to work, it has to know what the data format is. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the. Uh, in Java, you can specify an iterator over. I mean, it's just. It's a class with uh, a defined interface, and same basic principle. You you have a uh, the interesting thing is the for loop. So what do you do with uh, what do you do for each record in the data store? Um, the the kind of linkage. It, uh, how do you retrieve a record? How do you construct the iterator? That's all. That can all essentially be hard coded for each data structure that you create. Um, off the top of my head, I, I couldn't tell you what specifically they're using, but um, I mean. So, yeah, I guess the thing I was really trying to get is what's the, the benefit of it, like the problem they're trying to solve this project. It seems like it's how do we decrease compute per element of X, Y, or Z? Yeah, exactly. Um, rather than, I mean, nominally, you'd have to run an interpreter to kind of figure out, first figure out, okay, what am I doing for each, uh, for this record? What am I, uh, okay, I'm doing some arithmetic. What's the operator that I'm doing? Uh, then I have to go through the unboxing overhead. What's the type that I'm working with? Um, if you can compile it all down, if you, I mean, you know the types of the, the data that you're working with. You know the, uh, the, um, the class of the, uh, the, the, uh, data structure that you're iterating over, um, you can hard code all of these, and uh, that speed that will speed things up quite a bit if you can compile all of that away. Yeah, in principle, same. There it's taking advantage of Java's just-in-time compilation, but yeah, same basic principle. Um, except, yeah. Yeah. Except with better performance because it's not running over Hadoop. Hadoop. All right. Yeah. When you're looking at optimization, you do uh, look at like the start procedures and do this. And I get triggered. It's going to be a start procedure to optimize. Um, so most database, uh, most database systems, or uh, Oracle, SQL Server, will do a little bit of pre-compilation. Like they'll, they'll do the optimization pass. Um, they'll figure out what the best execution plan is for the query, but there's still the overhead of an interpreter. Um, I don't believe off the top of my head any of the, any of the commercial database systems have incorporated a way to get rid of that interpreter overhead. Um, you could hypothetically write your entire query in C and use kind of the uh, PLC or PL um, Ruby or, or what have you to basic, basically perform the entire query manually, but then you're essentially implementing your own joins, implementing all of this stuff that 
ostensibly the database should be doing for you. That's the whole idea of having a SQL. You don't have to do that. Exactly. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for. Work. Well, it works for DB Toaster. Um, Hyper's gotten some good performance benchmarks as well. I mean, it's not going to perform as well as a, a handwritten C program, but well, it performs well enough, which for most use cases is good enough. Well, I guess nobody else wants to pick on you. I guess we can't do very much. I need to get my... Uh,